Hello and welcome to another lecture of our Facts Only series. Today's subject is vitamin B3 or niacin. I'm Dr. Mohamed Tinawi. If you would like to know more about my medical background, please look at the description below. So niacin is the same as vitamin B3. However, uh, medically, we usually say niacin. We don't say vitamin B3 very, very often. I'm going to use niacin and vitamin B3 interchangeably. So today, um, our objectives are to discuss chemistry, function, dietary sources, recommended daily requirement, niacin deficiency, and finally, adverse effects and toxicity. As we said before, niacin is a water-soluble vitamin. If you would like to know more about vitamins, please watch lecture one, which was thiamine or B1, and lecture two, which was riboflavin or B2. What about the chemistry of vitamin B3 or niacin? Niacin is also known as nicotinic acid. In the body, it is converted into nicotinamide, and uh, the word amide comes from that group. I put a big uh, uh, blue arrow, and it's the carbon, oxygen, and the NH2 if you're super interested. What matters is nicotinamide is going to form through uh, complex chemical reactions, nicotinamide adenine dinucleotide, or NAD. NAD and NADP, which is NAD phosphate, are very essential. You cannot live without them. Okay, NAD is central in energy metabolism, in the electron chain reaction. Therefore, uh, vitamin B3 or niacin is essential in the synthesis, okay, in the making and metabolism of everything, fatty acids, carbohydrates, and proteins. So this is why this vitamin is very, very critical. The human body can make niacin from tryptophan. Now, tryptophan is an essential amino acid. There are eight or nine essential amino acids that our body cannot make. You need to get them from diet. So tryptophan can be converted to nicotinamide in the liver. Okay, this is variable from one person to the next. It requires vitamin B6, and you need like 60 milligrams of tryptophan to get one milligram of niacin. Anyway, this conversion provides a significant portion of niacin for humans. Therefore, if you are on a medication that is going to block this conversion of tryptophan to vitamin B3 or niacin, you are going to be low on niacin. You're going to have niacin deficiency. Fortunately, niacin is wildly available in diet, whether you are on plant diet or animal-based diet, uh, you should be good. Meat, especially liver, has a lot of niacin. I don't necessarily recommend that you eat liver. It's very high in uric acid, and that can cause gout. It's high in fat, etc. But anyway, meat, chicken, beef is high in niacin. Yeast, grains, legumes, corn, are also good sources. One thing about corn, it has to be treated with alkali, okay? Otherwise, you're not going to get much niacin. So this is as in corn used in tortillas, okay? So uh, go ahead and have those uh, tortillas. Uh, they're good. Uh, fortified cereals are good the source for niacin and seeds. The recommended daily requirement is about 50 milligrams, uh, so about uh, 60 milligrams in men, 40 milligrams in women, so let's say 15 milligrams daily. Let's keep this number in mind for a minute. Now, what happens if you're low on niacin? Now, many things can happen, but when the deficiency, when the level is really low, there is a disease called pellagra, and every medical student knows about that. And uh, it has four manifestations, and we call them the four Ds. 
The first D is for dermatitis, which is skin inflammation. So the areas that are exposed to the sun are going to be inflamed, they're going to be pigmented, and uh, this is what we call photosensitive pigmented dermatitis. So as you can see, the skin is red, angry, and inflamed. The second D is for diarrhea. Fortunately, I don't need to show you a picture for that. Uh, the third one is for uh, dementia, and if the person continues to be severely deficient, it's going to end in death. Why? Because you cannot live without niacin. You cannot make energy. Now, what causes niacin deficiency? So everything I'm going to mention here means that the person who is taking that medication or who has that condition should take niacin. And many of these things, especially the top line, uh, we talked about it with B1 and with B2. So the same thing is repeating itself, like alcoholism. Uh, alcoholics um, drink beer or wine. These are not good sources for many, many vitamins. So they're going to be deficient with B1, B2, niacin, B6, B12, etc. After a bariatric surgery, People with eating disorders, such as anorexia nervosa, malabsorption, people on dialysis. Uh, also, carcinoid syndrome, this is a tumor in the intestine and uh, the lungs. It's uh, a neuroendocrine tumor. And in that condition, the tryptophan, which the body uses to make a lot of niacin, is converted into something else, 5-hydroxytryptophan and serotonin. So therefore, you're not going to have enough niacin. Certain medications also are going to block this conversion of tryptophan to niacin, so they're not going to be enough niacin, like isoniacid, perazinamide, and ifeonamide. These are medicine used for tuberculosis. Phenobarbital, an old medicine for seizures, is a thioprine. We use it for many immunological disorders. Chloramphenicol is an antibiotic not used very much in the United States. And fluorouracil, which is a chemotherapy used for many cancers, especially colon cancer. So anyone on any of these medications should take niacin. Now, we said usually for water-soluble vitamins like niacin, there's not enough there's not much toxicity or adverse reactions. However, in the past, we used niacin to control dyslipidemia, which means high cholesterol and high tri triglycerides. And it was a pretty good medicine. It lowered cholesterol. It lowered actually bad cholesterol and raised the good cholesterol, and it lowered the triglycerides. However, we had to use very big doses. I said the daily requirement is 15 milligrams. We had to use 1,000 to 3,000 milligrams per day. So many patients could not take it, and this is why we don't use it anymore. We use statins. We use simvastatin, atorvastatin, etc., because these medicines have much less side effects, and they have better outcome. So the side effects that the people had was flushing. This is why we used to give them aspirin for the flushing, nausea, vomiting, constipation, hives, itching, and even elevation in liver enzymes. I'm going to end here, and I'll see you in the next lecture.